I'm working off of four hours of sleep in my bed. <clears throat> hey. I just had a protein bar and it was uh, very fudgy and chocolatey and I loved it, but it's also possibly in my teeth. Just kind of, just gonna roll with it. <laughs> Hello everyone, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is, if you're new around here, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was a lot. If you're not new around here, what is up home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is usually, at this point it's become every other week. I'm sorry, that's not intentional. <laughs> Saturdays are when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Well, actually, no, last week is because I had to get my computer fixed and somehow ended up with a new computer because I'm bad at high pressure sales situations. <laughs> the last time we were here, we took quite the deep dive into the camp classic birthed from real life trauma, <laughs> AKA 1981's Mommy Dearest. White the video, it was quite the reception. The conversation, the discourse was so fascinating. As complicated as my emotions are with that movie, so are all of yours. Um, and so it was quite the uh, it was quite the experience. A very long video too, and those of you that love my long videos, you'll be happy with that one. So if you haven't checked that out already, you can check that out up above, or you can check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist, which is now resting at well over two million clicks. You guys have wanted to watch that entire playlist over. 2.1 million times at this point. That's hilarious. I'm so happy that you guys enjoy this series as much as I enjoy it and it's been so fun along the way. Now, this week, originally this week was intended to lighten the mood, right? Uh, last week was, or last time was a bit heavy, controversial even. But instead of getting somewhat of a respite, I just watched something that made me feel like I needed a receipt for the time spent. Like if, if you could charge wasting my time, what a day we would live, what a world. And beyond that, it just made me mad that I will never be able to return to a time when I didn't know that this movie existed. Today we're looking at another cheesy teen rom-com dramedy, rom-dramedy. Yeah, rom-dramedy. Again, I was watching this to lighten the mood and instead of that, all I got was just un bridled, untamed rage. Today we're looking at a sequel that literally no one asked for, no one wanted this. I think a sizable amount of people don't even know that this movie exists. And because I'm somewhat vengeful, now you'll have to know because I do. Today we're watching the 2011 straight to ABC Family sequel to the cult classic 2004 rom-dramedy that is actually amazing, Mean Girls. Today we're looking at the sequel Mean Girls 2. That whole like clause just made me very angry actually. <laughs> I've ever said this on my channel, but Mean Girls is one of my favorite movies <laughs> ever made. Like it's Mean Girls and Sweeney Todd. She said duality. I love that movie. I can quote that movie from beginning to end. I feel like though, you know, there's some parts that haven't aged great. <laughs> You know, it's a 2004 film, but for the most part, it's still pretty solid. If you've never seen the original Mean Girls, I highly recommend you do because it's again, a cult classic. I love that movie. Katie played by Lindsay Lohan is the new girl in town. Her family just moved from Africa where they were research zoologists. And now they moved to like California or some city. I don't think they really specify where. And now Katie is trying to navigate what it's like to be in high school in the United States, trying to find herself, not get lost in peer pressure, discovering who she is and who she wants to be. And the movie's just really funny. It does have a lot of like kind of tried and true tropes about teen dramedies, you know, the bullies, the jocks, the, you know, all that, what have you. But it takes it on in a way that's really refreshing and super funny. Basically, she's trying to find herself in the process. She loses herself, loses friends, loses identity, and then comes back together to make amends with all of these people and to essentially dismantle a lot of these really sexist, I, I know I sound very passionate because I am, but at the core, that's what it is. She comes together to try to help dismantle a lot of this very like sexist, um, inflammatory, conflicts between girls. At the end of the movie, you feel like a comfort in that 
girls don't have to be represented entirely as just bitchy and catty, that there can be like a resolution between women and that's not necessarily indicative entirely of their identity. Now, with that said, you might say, well, a whole movie about mean girls refutes that message, but I disagree. I think you need to see it not work to see it work, if you know what I mean. Anywho, love the movie, so funny quoted all the time. And so, as you can tell, as impassioned as I am right now, I was vaguely aware that somewhere out in the ether, there was something referred to as Mean Girls 2, which was A, never in theaters, B, doesn't have any of the original characters written or produced, if I'm not mistaken, by any of the major people. Don't nobody want to watch that shit. Tina Fey, Miss Tina. Tina Fey has a very distinct style of writing and to completely like take her out of this conversation of a sequel, I just knew it's like, you're not, you took away the people who made it what it is. All the actors, Rachel McAdams, Lindsay Lohan. Ooh, Amanda, what is her name? Amanda Sifanoza. Safri, Safrofer? Tina Fey is not in it. The only person that still is in it is the principal, the black dude. I don't actually know what his name is. Tim Meadows. Tim Meadows, I'm sorry. Love you, Tim. The only person that's still in it is Tim Meadows, the principal Duvall, who I'm getting ahead of myself. He's the only saving grace of this movie. The only time you will get anything genuinely funny and genuinely well delivered is when he's on screen, but everything else is around it. Everything around it is just so sh that I just, I was angry. Like this, Mean Girls, <laughs> Mean Girls is definitely a movie by nature, is very quite self-contained. It's literally the story of a new girl coming to a new school, losing herself, finding herself, the end. She uh, presumably graduates, so it's not like we're following them to college. That's the story. But for some reason they thought, hey, let's do it again with with, with people that we don't know, don't connect to, don't really care about. Um, do it pretty much exactly in the same formula, but just way shittier. In a way that it just feels like a knockoff bootleg of the original movie. And it's just like, we didn't need to do this. Some things don't need a sequel. And Mean Girls is one of those movies. There's a quality about it that makes it feel like it's way longer than it actually is. It's only like an hour and 37 minutes, but Jesus Christ. But you sit there and you're like, man, I'm uh, an hour and 37 minutes closer to death. Yeah, there is something quite infuriating about this movie that I can't quite explain outside of that. It makes you angry. I was like, absolutely not. Y'all got me gymnast bent, yoga bent, absolutely not. But alas, it is indeed my job to walk you guys through the valley of death <laughs> so that you are allowed to continue the rest of your life after watching this maybe 20 some odd, 30 some odd minute video without you having to watch an hour and 40 minutes of ABC Family Fodder. By the way, if you've never seen the first Mean Girls, I highly recommend you watch that movie first so you can get even angrier. <laughs> but anyway, without further ado, this is Mean Girls 2. So like I said, virtually none of the original cast is in this movie. Um, this movie came out in 2011. So what is that? Seven years after the original came out. If we're thinking about this in like real time, obviously those girls have long been gone from this high school and we're focusing on new people. And again, fundamentally bad idea. But this movie focuses on the new girl, Jo. Now, Jo is the daughter of an Indy 500 car engineer or car mechanic. And for some reason due to that, Jo has moved around a lot. I'm not quite understanding what, what about that job makes her have to move so much, but sure, whatever. And, but within the first few moments of this movie, actually before even watching it, but I was, certain after watching the first few moments of this movie that, ooh, Tina Fey didn't have nothing to do with this. It won the budget, obviously, it's straight to, it's straight to ABC Family, where good content goes to die. I was like, no, Miss Tina don't have nothing to do with this. There is no way that this budget would be so, so low. It had me wondering, like, how do you even get the rights to something, to make something like this? I just, but yes, Joe is coming to a new school and it is North Shore High, the, the high school that we all know and love from the first movie. Now, since Joe has moved around quite a lot, she's discovered a kind of plan of attack 
for every school that she goes to. She's like, I wanna go there. I don't wanna stand out too much, do my thing and leave. But the problem is she's the main character of a shitty teen movie. So of course she's gonna knot the other girls her way through the entire film and become hot topic number one. Now, remember when I said that this movie was just a cheap knockoff of the original? I really mean that at a, at a, at a fundamental level. There's so many like really poorly executed references to the original movie that were so iconic. The lunch table scene converted it into like a car reference one that doesn't make nearly as much sense. The muscle cars who think they own the road. I'm so perky, I might shake off my tube top cutesy cars. The high performance, high maintenance, Sports cars. Like this movie is full of like a bunch of very similar like knockoff moments, but they just like shit fight it. It's so try hard at that point. There's nothing like authentic or genuine about it. It's just like, yeah, we're making a second one. Also, as someone who was a teenager in 2011, did everyone dress like this? It's I like, I was <laughs> like, I honestly don't recall teenagers just walking around looking like Jackie Kennedy. But anyway, this is where we are introduced to this movie's Mean Girls or this movie's Plastics. Plastics were the mean girls in the first movie. They had their own like fan club even at the school. They were so popular. The head of the mean girls was Regina George. I remember one time someone called me Regina George as an insult and it was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, inaccurate, but okay, go off. She was a bad bitch. Like, what do you want me to say? Not the nicest chick in the world, but she was a bad bitch. But this significantly shittier version of the plastics is led by Mandy with an I. Now, of all the things that this movie really dropped the ball on, I think Mandy is the most egregious of them all. She is literally the least convincing <laughs> mean girl queen pen. Everyone around me is trying to make me believe that she's like this, this incredible intimidating, believable queen bee sort of thing. But there's something very awkward and meek about how she presents this like ultimate mean girl energy. And it's like, I don't know, this movie just sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to like analyze it to explain why it sucks so bad, but it just like, it just does. Like there's two other ones. There's one that's supposed to be dumb, one that's kind of neurotic. And then Mandy as, as the figurehead, as the as the HBIC, if you will. And uh, the thing is, she's just so bad at this. There is a certain level of bitchy that one must hold to be the head mean girl in a movie. Rachel McAdams did an amazing job. As Regina George. Like you believe that, wow, she's probably a horrible person. You'd really believe that she's out here making burn books and cheating on her boyfriend in the locker room. Whereas this one, a lot of her delivery for things are is incredibly meek, a bit too understated for a movie like this. It's just like another situation where y'all just can't leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave, like stop in while you're ahead. Game of Thrones. Like in no way is this girl believable in that she's like running the entire social hierarchy of this very large school with a bunch of other rich kids. Like Regina George would eat her up even after the whole like circle of life and girl girl world is at peace or whatever, we can just float. She would still come back and be like, you peasant, you've ruined my entire legacy. <laughs> Meyer, who was stupid enough to hit a home run with any boy willing to play. That's another thing about this movie. There's a bunch of like jokes that make me hate Joe more than the Mean Girls. Like I genuinely hate everyone in this movie. For the most part, everyone in this movie is so unlikable. Well, actually everyone's very unlikable in this movie. The only people that I actually enjoyed watching was Principal Duvall. Again, he was the saving grace of at all of this movie. And um, one character that they're gonna introduce later named Abby, she was okay. I didn't love her, but of everyone else, she was, I guess, decent. Everyone else can fall off a bridge. Soon we meet the girl that I was talking about. Her name is Abby. She's a nerd, an art nerd more specifically. And we meet her as she like rips in the garbage can or something and milk falls on it. Who cares? How bad do I look? She couldn't have looked worse. You look great. Really? Now we see Principal Duvall, again, the only saving grace of this movie. He is still pretty funny in any of his scenes. He's just, how he delivers lines is just so funny as like, a person. One of our lunch ladies was on the first season of American Idol. Good to know. Yeah, it's pretty hot. 
And uh, I'd even go so far as to guess that maybe a sizable amount of his delivery is improv because it'd be so weird if they did so well for just his character and then dropped the ball so significantly for everybody else. And for some reason, the principal has anything to do with like her course schedule. I don't Anyway, and she's like, I want to go to workshop. And so she, because she's not like the other girls, if you recall, uh, the other girls go to home ec and she goes to woodshop because she is a rebel. Now, how she's supposed to be a rebel, but also attempt to not stand out is truly beyond me, but I digress. She gets to the workshop, meets a boy who's kind of sexist, but does he have to change his ways for her to be interested in him? No, but her and Tyler, I'm sure will end up together. I have no idea what his name is, but he just looks like a Tyler to me. Did I mention that Joe isn't like the other girls? So <laughs> there's a scene where she's about to get sexually assaulted by, by a random dude. And she like karate chops with sound effects. No groping south of the equator or north creep. Don't touch south of the equator or north of it. Misogynistic pig, which though true, oh, the writing. But the whole school starts to notice that this new girl is not like the other girls exactly. And so because of that, it makes Mandy and her merry cohort of follow alongers super interested in acquiring her for the plastics. I finished my makeup so quickly today. Guess I'll order Panera. <laughs> Mandy is like, ooh, the new girl, new prospects. We're gonna make her into a plastic. Hell yeah, that's our new target. What? Mm -hmm. So for some reason, in a way that's supposed to not be understood in actual reality, because there's no way in hell they'd let her have a dog at school. Abby, the nerd girl, the nerd art girl from earlier, ends up giving the dog a little bit of her food. This results in the dog going back to Mandy's bag and boo-booing in it or throwing up. I think threw up, but to be honest with you, the, like, the concept of it boo-booing in her purse is actually funnier to me. So a boo-boo in her purse. Oh my God, who fed my dog? Abby, the pushover, is like, oh, I did, I'm sorry. If you want, you can have my bag, which is the new Prada bag with fringe or something. Hideous purse. Um, but apparently it's the bag that Mandy has been wanting for so long, but she couldn't get it because she was on the wait list. There is a scuffle that ends with Abby on the floor and with Mandy being the boss bitch that she is, going up to her and saying, I don't ever wanna see your face again. And don't ever look at me again. Better yet, don't even breathe the same air. Girl, give me a script. Let me do it. Cause I just, you can't, you can't do it right. Do it yourself. Like you are not giving me intimidating at all. I don't want you to breathe the same air as me. It's like, <sighs> ha! Like ain't nobody scared of her. She not even scared of her. I feel like she, I don't feel like she believes her role. I would love to play the mean girl in a movie, I'm just saying. And I am 26, I'm the perfect age to play like a high school sophomore. But yeah, there's nothing about her that's screaming like, I should be intimidated by her. Like I'm looking at her and she's like, oh, it's like, you get away, bitch. And I'm like, I will fart in your salad. <laughs> but she mad, bitch, throw the whole dog away. <laughs> That was kind of funny. Now back home, Joe, our main character, I think, I don't know, at some point the names just get me confused and they're all just like annoying bitch, one, two, and three. Joe, our main character, goes back home and talks to her dad and he basically tells her that he's not so sure if they have enough money for her to go to her dream college. Lost a lot of money in investments and, and the market isn't too great for race car engineers? I don't know. Do I look like somebody that sits there for three hours watching cars go around in a circle? Absolutely not. He don't have no money. If she can't go to the college she just wanna to go to, if you want to, you should probably go to the place in state where we can qualify for in-state tuition. And Joe is completely distraught because apparently this is where her dead mom used to go. We needed a dead mom. You can't have a teen protagonist without a dead parent because like, how do you become the main character of the show until you have at least one deceased parent? <laughs> I've gotten to the point I can make jokes, that's good. But she's like, I must go here cause mom went here. And this I guess is like her way of feeling close to her post -humor humorously, posthumously. How do you say that word after death? Posthumously. The adjective posthumous is applied to Posthumously. Is there a way to feel closer to her dead mom that is dead and deceased and passed on? Now around this time is where this movie really banks on me being fucking stupid. Around this time is when we find out what Abby's deal is. Apparently the social pariah of the school is also the most wealthy 
of all the people that go to this school, wealthier than Mandy. Presumably is why there's this kind of one-sided vendetta between Mandy and Abby, because everything that Abby has, Mandy wants. And I guess just one of many things is now Joe as a possible friend. Yes, again, another situation in which American media wants me to believe that the most oppressed and ostracized person in high school suburbia is supposed to be the rich, white, straight-sized, <laughs> able-bodied, <laughs> attractive woman, but sure, she is the black sheep here. She has no social life, no friends, everyone bullies her. She is the most, again, oppressed person in the room, shout out to our girl. Bullies end up paintballing her car. I don't know, all that money she got, just get a ride from a limo or something, or I don't know, or wiping the paintballs off. Oh no, let me leave my very expensive car at school and take a ride with Joe, who's willing to take me right back home. At this point, Joe sees her giant mansion and is like, whoa, this bitch got money. And this is where we begin, I guess, the main conflict of the movie because Abby meets Joe's father, who is this very rich like salesman type guy. And he's basically like, hey, can I pay your college tuition to be my daughter's friend? She's a loser. <laughs> my rich, conventionally attractive, straight sized, artistic, nice white daughter is hated by everyone. Here's some money to be her friend and if you want it, I will like pay your tuition. I will pay your first year's books. Be my daughter's friend. She is a fucking loser. He doesn't say it like that, but I'm paraphrasing. And with a proposal like this, how can she refuse? She reluctantly accepts. And now she's gonna be Abby's friend. Meanwhile, the plastics find out via very convenient video footage that Joe gave Abby a ride home after her car was paintballed. This in some way infuriates Mandy. Oh, who is this girl? Some badass biker chick? Wow, that's so, wow. <laughs> Someone unironically wrote that line and asked an actress to say it out loud. That's incredible. But yeah, Mandy's hell bent on making Joe a plastic. So what do they do? They go up to Joe, basically directly tell her, yeah, I'm here to let you know who you can and can't be friends with. And Joe's like, you a weirdo, which she is, which is very, very weird. And then someone warns her that if you're gonna turn down Mandy, it's gonna be hell for you because she is the ace bitch in charge. At least you keep saying it, so I guess you want me to believe it to be so. Be careful, you don't wanna make an enemy of Mandy. Girl, please. <laughs> Let her try to do this in a public school. They would eat her up like tapas. Mandy has a weird obsessive dislike of them becoming friends. Apparently this bitch just really doesn't have much going on in her life. It would make more sense, by the way, if they just turned this into like a lesbian love triangle, it would make a lot more sense because though how obsessed Mandy ends up being over whether or not they can be friends just does not make sense to me if you're not trying to smash. And even if you were, it's still creepy, but you know what I mean? Like there's some, there's an intensity here that's, we build a whole movie off of this concept and I'm just like, hmm. But yes, she's so obsessed with the notion of them becoming friends that she finds the location of Joe's house, sneaks into her dad's garage, finds adhesive and puts it on her seat of her like scooter thingy. What is that thing called? A Vespa? The little scooter thing that she sit on and then she go to school with. I guess they don't expect me to ask questions, but when would she have done this? Because the next morning is when she sits on the seat. So did she just have it sitting there getting tacky overnight? Did she come back the morning of and do it? Did like, whatever, but Joe sits on it and now her pants are stuck. Abby and Joe rush to the bathroom and we have a very realistic situation where she's allowed to drive her moped or whatever the hell this is through the hallways of her school and wasn't expelled immediately. But she's forced to forego her pants because she can't get them off of her uh, scooter seat. Abby offers her her art smock, which has a bunch of paint splatters on it. And she walks out and suddenly she is the new fashion trend. Everyone goes to school with paint splattered clothing, which I do vaguely remember paint splattered clothing being a bit of a thing when I was in high school. Hideous, horrible time in our lives. That. And um, I still like Lita's. I still like Lita shoes. I think those are still cute to me, okay? Bring back the Lita's, those are cute. But remember those like heels that look like you had scullios? <laughs> what were those called? <laughs> I never knew what they were called. That's always how 
I described them. It was like the scoliosis heels. <laughs> now, like I briefly mentioned before, Joe has a crush on the guy from shop class. This attraction is of course solidified because she sees him shirtless one day playing football or something and they have to do the whole like slow motion wet thing, which is kind of, okay. Uh, I want to spice it up. I want to give it like a soft, gentle vibe. FKA Twigs version. up wanting to go on a date with. Abby warns her not to go, but Mandy, being her weird obsessed self, decides to put a tape recorder in their car on the date so that she can have some incriminating evidence out and about about them. They go on their date. Instead of actually showing it, they give us a weird photo montage thing. How lazy. Uh, Tyler asks her like how many boyfriends she's had and she says she hasn't had any. And he was like, oh, so you never kissed anybody? And she's like, no, I never kissed anybody. And then they kiss. Tape recorder is in the car. I feel like the more I talk about this movie, I'm like dying on the inside. Can you see the light in my eyes leaving? <laughs> <laughs> I hate it here. The tape recorder is in the car and somehow they were allowed to play this tape recorder over the announcement intercom video thing. And for some reason, the new knowledge that the new girl is a virgin is scandalous. <sighs> I even say this every time this trope comes up because it really bothers me. Again, nobody cares. Or okay, maybe I'm speaking over people, but at least in my high school, nobody gave a sh and this is, and this is, and now I can speak in the time period. I would have been in either sophomore or junior year of high school at this point when this movie came out. When I tell you nobody gave a f if you were having sex, if you weren't, no one cared. What is it with like adults making high school stories and making virginity such a pariah when even high schoolers don't care? Or again, I might be speaking out of turn. Maybe somebody else's high school cared more, but our high school just, I just, I can't resonate with this particular trope that comes up so much. High school movies, undoubtedly made from people who are probably double my age, and I haven't been in high school in almost 10 years. Um, <laughs> undoubtedly like 50 year old people writing movies about high schoolers, and they really have this like impression that not having sex matters at all. And again, here's my big sis PSA, have sex when you wanna have sex, have sex when you're comfortable, have sex when you're safe. Granted, I say, I've said this before that having sex in high school is really of no benefit. <laughs> There's nothing you get out of that. There's no maturity there, no emotional maturity, sexual maturity, no fully working frontal cortex. College is where you hoe it out or college age is where you hoe it out. I digress. <laughs> have sex when you wanna have sex, have, don't have sex if you never want to. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, asexual people exist. And that's, that's my thing on that. But despite her being a virgin, Joe is able to get a few fans of her decision to not sleep with someone until she felt like she met the right guy. She ends up arguing with Tyler because she thinks that he kind of told everybody her business when in actuality she was bugged by Mandy and her boyfriend. That boyfriend and Tyler end up getting in a fight, but who cares? And around this time is when I realized I'm about 45 minutes into this movie. And it's in a very like kissing booth type way, but even more condensed to some extent. Kissing booth is way worse because they tried to, they, they are funny. They were like, let's make this a two hour movie for no reason in this all montage. It still feels like it drags so painfully for so long because it's just a bunch of like, there isn't any cohesiveness. It's just a bunch of stuff happening. Like nothing feels like it's driving a story. It's just a bunch, it's like a montage of events and none of which are like particularly engaging. So you're just like, yes, and this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. Yes, the whole movie has been nothing but just like pranks, slut shaming, virgin shaming, and girls just kind of fighting each other with no real motivation to do so. Joe and Tyler had gotten in a fight after the recording thing happened because she thought he had something to do with it or that he was having sex with Mandy behind her back. 
but apparently she finds out they're actually step siblings and therefore could not have done anything, which I find hilarious because <laughs> there is far too much porn, <laughs> far too much pornography on the internet that is focused around step siblings having sex to believe that that came out of nowhere. Okay, you can think you're in safe graces if you want to, but but that's enough for them to make up. She's like, oh my God, I should have trusted you. Mandy breaks into Joe's house again, this time to put sweet and low and coffee in her dad's tank. All I think, I just sit there and I'm like, one swift, let me beat your ass and this would all be over. I feel like violence occasionally is the answer. I don't, <laughs> one quick, it would be good, but. Alas. Oh, my food here. Broccoli cheddar soup, baby. But she goes over to somebody's house because they don't want to be her friend. Put sugar in her dad's tank and coffee. I'm gonna get lipstick all over my face. I didn't, I didn't plan this out. But as you imagine, this messes up her dad's car, right? He's over here like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills. I don't know how I'm gonna get the money for whatever, anything. I'm like, we gonna have to be homeless or something, I don't know. By the way, I'm just gonna spoil it. We never come back to this. Just one day he's not about to be homeless. But Joe notices some packs of Sweet and Low. And she's like, the only bitches I know in the world that eat Sweet and Low are them plastic bitches because nobody else in the world, I guess. Mandy had gone too far. It was as if all my girl hormones had kicked into overdrive and I was out for blood. Now, I don't know if there are any men writing this, but if there's at least one, I'm like 98% sure that he had something to do with it. What the f do girl hormones have to do with wanting to beat a bitch ass for legitimate reasons? But this means war, people. Meantime, as our other storyline that they forgot to continue with, the one where she's like friends with Abby for money. She's like, oh my God, I feel guilty for being friends with Abby for money. Especially as they're becoming closer friends. Mandy has a birthday party. And so they decide to have their own party, have a party battle so that nobody goes to her party. Mandy, irritated about this, asked one of the plastics if they still have their epicac, like the stuff that makes you throw up. She's just carrying that with her. Should we look in on her? Is she okay? She's like, yeah, I got it. And they decide to lace all the pizzas with this medication that'll make everybody throw up. Joe, ever the wise one, notices that something is wrong with the pizza before anybody can eat it and throws it away, all save one slice that she gives to Mandy's boyfriend. And he throws up on Mandy. Gross. Next scene. Now, as an official counterstrike to the authoritarian rule of the plastics, Joe and Abby create the anti-plastics. Very original. Essentially, they end up making a whole crew of not like the other girls. And then they dress like each other, ironically. Now I must say, much like the rest of this movie, nothing about this girl war is at all entertaining or interesting. Basically, it's just more pranks that we didn't like in the first place, but it results in some kind of sloppy infighting between Mandy and the rest of the plastics. Now, Joe starts to kind of revel in the power, something that Abby starts to notice and questions if she's okay with doing all this bad stuff. And Joe's like, yeah. And slowly but surely, Joe becomes new Queen B. She is the leader of the anti-plastics. Now everyone's like, hey, hey. And she's like, hey. And that's how you know she's, she's evil now because people know who she is and she responded. But lo and behold, that's not the only way you can tell she's evil. She also now watches her sugar consumption and wears studded boots. I wonder how much sugar is in this. You did not just ask Beth. No, you ate like two funnel cakes, a hot dog, and a bag of kettle corn on our first date. You didn't wear these crazy studded boots. What happened to that girl I met in shop class? <laughs> what if she's like diabetic? <laughs> There's no way my lipstick is surviving. <laughs> At some point on a jog, Mandy overhears, oh, all these names. Mandy overhears Abby's dad telling Joe or thanking Joe for being her friend for money. And Abby's like, oh, I can't accept your money. Like, I don't, I can't do this anymore. I can't accept your money. And Mandy, of course, runs with this information and goes swiftly to the school paper. And Abby finds out that Joe is her friend for money and how embarrassing that is. There's a, oh my God, how can you do this to me? And then we just go on to the next scene because I'm sure they'll be friends by the end of it, whatever. Because this is a teen movie, we have to have a school dance, in this case, the homecoming dance. And Mandy, Annoyed that she hears that Joe is a shoe in for homecoming queen this year, she finds out that the only way that she can disqualify her from homecoming is if she gets expelled. She goes into the office and steals charity money from the office of the school and plants it at Joe's house. Again, this is the third time she's broken into that girl's house. And then the principal calls the police after getting an 
anonymous tip that Joe had all the money at her house. She's called into the office, threatened to get expelled. But before doing so, she runs out and confronts Mandy. And somehow, they don't immediately expel her. Somehow they let her say, we should do a powder puff football game to settle this before I leave, I guess. I don't know, what what school y'all been to? Like, okay, they don't expel her immediately. She's like, yeah, I'll give you time to play football over your like girl rivalry type thing. Sure, why not? Also football, the most random thing that they could have used is like a climax of this movie. Cause maybe racing, cause we've referenced that before. <laughs> I'm gonna rush through this because at this point I got my bowl here and I wanna bite into it, but I can't do so without getting lipstick on like my nose and my lips, <laughs> like camel mouth thing. So let's just rush through this real quick. They about to play football, but Joe realizes too late that she has no friends anymore because everybody hates her. Go up to her and say, well, we don't forgive you, but we don't think it's okay that Mandy is allowed to get away with framing you like that. So we'll play football with you. They play football. It was not funny and it went on too long. Meanwhile, during the game, a nerd hacks into the security camera and finds the footage of Mandy and her boyfriend, sorry, these names, Mandy and her boyfriend breaking into the school and stealing the money. Why they didn't do that before this and just took an anonymous tip, who knows? They arrest Mandy's boyfriend and Joe, <laughs> And Joe tackles Mandy. They win the football game and she gets arrested for stealing. There's a touchdown at some point. I don't even know, like girl, she, she about to get arrested. Like <laughs> the game's kind of over at this point. Homecoming happens. And the nerd makes it that he wins Homecoming King, even though nobody knows who he is because he has a crush on Abby and Abby ends up winning Homecoming Queen because Joe forfeits. They are their nerdy selves together. Everybody makes up, kiss, kiss, hug, hug. Joe ended up getting some money because she ended up working with Abby's dad on like an invention that made her some money so she could go to college. Abby, Joe, no, what's her name? Mandy. <laughs> Mandy gets community service where she has to pick up garbage. Tyler goes to a school that's about an hour away from Joe and Joe and Abby end up going to the same college as besties. And that's the end of the movie. I hate everyone. I hate everyone that ever recommended this movie to me because you didn't care about my will be. You couldn't have. I hate everybody that made this movie because you put work in to make this shit. Like you, you brought a bunch of people together. There's an editor, writers, casting directors, film people. You brought them all together to make this shit for no reason that no one, again, I cannot reiterate that more. That literally no one said, we need another one. None of the same people. Again, the only saving grace was the principal. He was kind of funny at some parts, but for the most part, it's just a winding road of bullshit. What a fucking throwaway. But that is all for today, folks. So you are welcome. You don't have to watch this movie ever again. And I've watched it three times. You are welcome. You know the drill. If you like the video, feel free to like the video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. If you have recommendations for the next Bad Movies in a Beat, feel free to put that down in my comment section. And I will see you guys next time.